about the wonderful world of esports. I'm still just Mike. Hi, I'm Alex Kim, aka Chizzy. I'm Steven Petrusik. And with us today, we've got Sarah. How are you, Sarah? Doing very well, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Sarah here. Why don't you uh, tell the tell the fine people a little bit about yourself? Oh boy. Okay. So my name is Sarah Wag. I'm currently working at Durham College as their esports arena manager. With that, we do hey, 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 hey. events in the arena. <laughs> we work on varsity esports. We've got eight teams moving into this academic year. Ooh. We do academic components for releasing a graduate cert. So if you want to go to school for business, but you want to move into the esports industry, then it gives you that nice little cherry on top. So you yes. know what you're doing when you're getting yourself into it. It's amazing. We thought it would Fantastic. be a, a great idea to have you on the podcast today because here on, on Best of Three on this podcast, we don't we tend to not like to leave the people alone. Um, if, if there are people who don't understand things about esports and they want to kind of get into it, uh, we like to kind of zoom out on a topic far enough for, for kind of anybody to understand and then zoom in on the finer points. So because the three of us are just a couple idiots who don't know much about collegiate esports, we thought, <laughs> you know what, we'll do as much research as we can, and then we'll come to you, the the expert, and see what uh, what you can give to us. So if that's if that's all right with you, I'll do my best. Amazing. <laughs> so today we thought that we would uh, zoom out on on kind of the past, the present, and the future of of collegiate esports, um, and and to start. Uh, we actually wanted to dive into the the, the past of collegiate esports. So we're going to go uh, ten years into the into the past. Yeah. We're going to go to where we are today, and then we're going to go ten years into the future and see where we where we think things are going, or if there's anything that we can do now to kind of influence what the future is going to look like. Ten years ago, it's like it seems like it was a long time ago, but right? it's also. Like it 2009 doesn't, like doesn't a long feel time like ago. it was a long yeah, time ago. It's so true. It's weird. It's really it sounds weird like a long time. It doesn't feel like a long time. That's what it is. No, exactly. yeah, it feels like yesterday. So what happened in 2009? We so, had uh, yeah. Tell oh, me. sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, All you, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So way back when, um, Stephen, you have you have a little bit more notes than I do on this one. But uh, way back in the day, uh, Collegiate Star League or CSL, CSL was yeah. just a bunch of StarCraft Brood War. Uh, uh, players, players, yeah, right. Twenty five teams, yeah. Twenty five teams, and so how did how did that all get started, Stephen? Do you have any idea? Nope. No. <laughs> Do you have any idea what the the start of collegiate? the collegiate scene was like, yeah. like ten years ago? It makes sense to me that it starts with a game like StarCraft. StarCraft has always been a very die-hard community. Yeah. It's a hard to get into community, but because of that, everyone who's currently in the community knows one another. Mm. And mm. With your when you're with a group of buddies, you want to be like, okay, guys, who's the best? Yeah. Like, which one of us is taking the title? <laughs> yeah. So, Collegiate Star League focused primarily on North American schools, very heavily within the United States, and then they branched out, started moving towards Canada. But they noticed that a lot of students, college and university students, were into these sort of games. Mm. A lot of people picked up StarCraft when it first started coming out. They might have been 14, kept playing it, kept growing with it. And then when you hit college and university, yeah. you're a little bit more comfortable. You start to meet other people who like the same things that you do. Right. So Collegiate Star League zoned in on this group of people. And that's when they were like, okay, we see something here. We like this. These players like it. Let's make it happen. Let's see if this is something that sticks. And mm. it did. Yeah. Mm. And I'm sure it's also easier to like make teams out of schools, right? Like, instead of like, oh, what's our team name? It's like, my school's better than your school. Right, And there's right. always that kind of rivalry, right? And I could imagine that as quickly as, as that has kind of picked up with just StarCraft, I, th I feel like all of the other kind of games, everybody who played any other games, seeing what's happening in StarCraft would kind of feel the same way and, and think, you know what, we want to we wanna bring our our games on as well so that's how you have uh games introduced like uh, now we have several games introduced actually oh, yeah. in, the, in the collegiate star league i think you said it was somewhat some something around nine uh how many games are there is there about nine games in uh in csl now right it depends if you count the games that died last year rest uh, in peace heroes of the storm they're no longer within any of the collegiate leagues ooh, well they're not being supported anymore R. right they're not being supported anymore so it doesn't make sense for collegiate leagues to continue to support a game that isn't being supported right, itself that makes, sense. That makes yeah. sense yeah oh that's a rough one sorry hot fans <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that was that was essentially the past of of collegiate starling well there's also tespa there's tespa, tespa, tespa 2013 
Tess was a little bit younger. Yeah, yeah so it started up. four years later t- in 2013. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Tespa? Sure, I love Tespa. Mm-hmm. Tespa is something I know very well. They started in Texas, which is why it's T-E-S-P-A. It was yeah, a Texas, Texas Esports Association. It was run out of a, a university down oh, in cool. Texas. Cool. Awesome. So what happened with that story is this school was running... I think it was a ridiculous event. I think it had something to do with a hot dog eating contest between very popular <laughs> players That's within where all a specific start. game. Back when it was called T H D P A. What? Uh, <laughs> hot dog. PA. So I'm gonna good one, Mike. Good on one. one. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> one sec. Let me check my computer and <laughs> kind of make sure that this is these are facts we're spitting here. I'm sorry. Continue. This ridiculous event was pulling higher viewership than some of the other tournaments that were being broadcast oh at the same time. Interesting. So oh. everyone was like, "Who are these guys? Why is their event getting more viewership than us?" Do you know what kind of tournaments? those were like uh, esports tournaments or esports tournaments mm, yes okay land style so everyone would be coming into the same large room yeah bringing their own computers bringing their own console classic setting up playing with other students and they pulled for more than just their demographics so they were pulling outside students members of the public were coming as well oh okay so because of their success with this event blizzard was like hey we like this we like what you guys are doing you're mm. playing one of our games we like this we want to work more with you so the rosen twins as well as an individual named Chris, the three of them founded TESPA. Mm. And TESPA partnered with Blizzard Entertainment. With that, it was Blizzard Entertainment's attempt at a CSL, a collegiate league focused on their own games. With CSL, they don't primarily create games themselves. So they pick games that they notice are popular mm. and they'll run leagues for them for college and university students well that's perfect actually that's a perfect partnership seems like for blizzard right it does um, it certainly supports does supports their games increases playership all of that good stuff yep yeah. and you'll notice once in a while on the blizzard client they'll pull in games that aren't blizzard titles yep. so right now you'll see call of duty on it so people are wondering and speculating if we're going to get a call of duty league now that it's in the blizzard client that would Ooh, make sense because right, of the activision Ooh. partnership exactly right right right, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very cool. I wonder if, um, I guess, Battle.net is thinking about adding any other, like, big titles to their um, to the roster, kind of like how Epic Games is doing it. I'm sure that's kind of just, like, buying goal. IPs. Yeah. yeah. So Because COD's a big one. Absolutely. I mean, I think they snagged a really good one there. Off topic, Epic Games launcher is terrible. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Off topic. Oh, sorry, let's get back on topic. Let's go back. back. <laughs> Off topic. That was just a that was just a mini rant there. That's like fair. not even a rant, but okay, let's get back. One battle net's not that great either. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Um, so Neither is Steam. That was, that was I think they're all kind of getting. Yeah, really. We um, so from the the transition from 2009, we kind of stopped a little bit in 2013. So yes. let's let's move a little bit further ahead into where we're at present. now. Yeah. 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 So, so Alex, those are the. Go ahead. Yeah, so those are the big players um, back in the day. I want to kind of talk about what's going on now. Like, who are the big companies investing? Like, Tespa's still in it, I'm assuming. CSL, still in it. Um, Are there any, like, really big tournaments happening? And, you know, um, what are, like, the biggest schools running in these tournaments? Like, what are the big names in... Collegiate sports, right yeah. 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 One of the organizations that we've overlooked is Riot. So Riot runs their mm. own collegiate league specifically for their game title. Oh, that's fantastic. Collegiate they didn't even finals. Know that. Uh, as of this year, second place was a Canadian team. Shout out to Western University. Hey, Ooh. let's go. <laughs> they pulled the Canadian title, which was nice. We haven't placed second since 2016 when U of T pulled the second place title. That's Ooh. right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, what's the league called? They changed the name. It was ULOL, University League of Legends. Then I think it oh. went to College Lol. They partnered with CSL one year. Oh, so it sort of bounces around. It's not like its own yeah. full blown league or anything, but okay. I think they're going solo this year. Fantastic. And I'm assuming okay. it's going to be College League of Legends, something along that line. Something like that. Right. They, they took their time 
uh, learning through the other organizations, and now they're like, oh, we can do it ourselves. Mm-hmm. Well, League of yeah. Legends is an absolutely massive game everywhere, absolutely. but for Collegiate 2, I'm sure is uh, one of the, the top games, right? League also likes to do its own thing a lot. They do. Yeah, they like to kind of keep themselves separate and have their own kind of community and bubble yeah. in everything that they do, so that would make sense that they would mm-hmm. kind of steer their way into Collegiate at the same time. Yeah, as for power play schools, the majority of them are American schools. American schools have had the lead on us for years. Uh, right. Right. So if you think back, a lot of people, when they start to think about collegiate esports, right away they think of UCI, University of California, mm-hmm. Irvine. They've been considered one of the forefront leaders in collegiate esports for the longest time because of, of their esports arena. It's the California Air. Their official varsity players. They've yeah. got broadcast and production available on site for students to do to stream their games, to stream the tournaments they do. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. It's the mangoes and the air and the beach. <laughs> it's all California. You know, you get the palm trees. <laughs> but they're also where all the game companies are. So right. all of their students right. usually get the tie-in with all of the big game developers. That's sweet. That's Not awesome. Not only are you, one, going to school for something you love, two, doing something you love, but three, you're talking to the people that, like, created these things that you love, too. Yeah. The gods of these games, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like a co-op experience, but you're competing. Yep, and they take a lot of internships from these students as well. So how jealous are you guys being Canadian? Oh, man. Oh, Ooh, yeah. But free healthcare, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> Don't knock the free healthcare. If I break my finger doing some macros, you know, I mean, we good. Hey, we, we've got, like, Ubisoft. <laughs> we, we do have Ubisoft. <laughs> Our six is getting bigger. It's You know what? It's not, um, it's not a dead scene. Uh, it's growing. Ontario, for sure. It's, it is it's growing. It's definitely growing, yeah. so... Um, good for them, really. They they persevered through what looked like a dying game. Absolutely. And, you know, and, that's and back. kind of through that growth, that's that's how we are at where we are at today. So uh, I, I feel like we have some statistics on uh, kind of where we are right now. Stephen, you want to share some of those? Yeah. So um, for CSL, we have about like 1,600 campuses competing, um, over 10,000 students, which is amazing. And around $15 million in scholarships. Is that right? Does that sound accurate? That does. It's growing, and every year we're getting more and more involved in it. More schools are noticing that other schools are doing it, and Mm -hmm. they feel the need to hop on so that they're not the ones left in the dust. Isn't that how it always is? That's how trends start, right? Everyone trying to hop on the bandwagon. Who was the the Canadian trendsetter here? Was it St. Clair College? St. Clair College was the first one to do official varsity. Mm. Oh, so they cool. were the first one to do varsity teams, start branching into varsity academic. Right. Right. Um, but I assume there were other schools that were sort of part of CSL before uh, St. Clair got into it? or There's been a lot of schools within Ontario specifically that have had student-run clubs that have been joining these right. leagues since the leagues were officially founded. But uh, they didn't have the school backing. It was just a group of buddies. They tried to find the best players in the school. Bros. <laughs> just yeah, a bunch of bros. Just a bunch of bros. Like, Saturdays are for the boys. They'd do their tournament days. They'd practice. And... Through that way, a lot of schools have been noticed. So, for example, I brought up Western earlier. They weren't mm-hmm. officially supported by their school when they right. won second place at ULL this year. Oh, wow. wow. But after winning, their school was like, you know what? You guys are good. Like, <laughs> let's yeah, get all it took this. was us to win. <laughs> just a win. Just blood, sweat, and tears. Well, it was second place. They didn't win. But... That's true. And I mean, that's kind of the, that's kind of indicative of what it was like in the past, too, is, is, you know, it was just a group of buddies who got together to play, and then eventually people took notice to that because they did it big enough to actually get noticed and and so when you've got places like western you know actually placing in major events um they're the ones who are doing it big and second place is like first place in canada right I let's mean, be real okay yeah. <laughs> i'm not going to spend this podcast just <laughs> placing a giant on, on canada, canada the um, uh, i did want to talk about uh nace they're new right they are a newer company. They just started including Canadian schools this year. Okay. Of course, it was St. Clair being the front runner in Canada. Uh, okay. So we know nothing about that at all. So Okay, so let's start with this. Do you, as, as a college, do you have to participate in only one of the leagues, or can you participate in multiple leagues? How does this work? What yeah. NACE is, is the North American Association of Esports. And what they're looking to do is they want to set the foundation and guidelines to participate in uh, esports tournaments. Mm, when it comes to sports leagues, there's all these rules, restrictions, policies. Regulations. Things that you follow, and they set the standard for that sport. Mm-hmm. What they're trying to do is they're trying to be that for esports. So what they do is they talk to colleges and universities from across 
the United States and St. Clair as right. their one Canadian school. <laughs> Represent. For now. Represent. Ooh, let's For go now. esports pro. <laughs> and they do as well run their own leagues, which yeah. are only open to schools that register to be a part of this. Right. But there mm-hmm. is a fee associated with membership, and a lot of schools that are first starting out into esports might not have that kind of money or might not know enough about it to get involved. Right. Or see. want to get involved because they don't have the kind of professional backing and you know the minds in the kind of the top of it yeah and i mean even places that are professionally backed without those kind of regulations it's it's kind of risky to get into right because you can't just be a major organization willing to dump all of this this time money and resources in on on certain organizations that are completely unregulated and this is something that we were talking about actually uh before the podcast is just the lack of regulation in in the past of esports yeah uh, so it's something that i wanted to get into yeah. as well um what are what are sort of like you said there is nace but is there any sort of regulations um and rules right now and uh what does that look like sort of going into the future so each league sets their own rules and regulations mm. so if it's not a fully established league you might not know how credible it is you don't know if you're going to get paid out your prize pool because if you're mm. playing in an online league this company could be based in florida and we're all the way up in canada so right. how do you communicate with them and make sure that you get your prizing especially when it's crossing that border interesting the types of uh, rules and regulations I actually had in mind were um, more to do with the players themselves. So if you look at um, traditional sports, you're looking at um, a lot of drug testing, there's no cheating, there's academics that are involved as well. Uh, what does this look like for the players that are playing in these uh, collegiate leagues? Yeah, do you need to have like a certain grade to play? Yeah. The two common ones are you have to be a full-time student of that academic institution, Mm -hmm. not counting online students. You have to be physically a full-time student on campus. Damn, I was about to sign up for some free courses. (laughs) Yeah, and it has to be the main campus. For example, the University of Toronto has three separate campuses. Right. So each campus would have their own team. You can't switch or flip between the two campuses. Right. The GPA requirement is very often a 2.0 or above, which in Canadian terms, that's about a C for us, mm-hmm. a C average or higher. That's pretty standard, right, in leagues? Like uh, even in traditional sports? Sports leagues as well? I'm, I'm not quite sure, actually. Um, but it seems like it's not too high of a bar. It's not impossible, definitely. Yeah, but our GPA system is different from American GPA systems. So it's a little bit tricky that way as well, because a fail for us in a lot of our provinces is a 50%. That's if you right. start to look at Quebec and America, they're a 60% fail yes. rate. Ah, uh, so a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing I want to talk about is uh, is uh, the usage of like performance-enhancing drugs. Um, so obviously uh, stuff like Adderall is used a lot for studying and um, um, people have used it in gaming as well, um, to, you know, saying that it, it is performance boosting. Um, what kind of regulations surround the uh, sort of uh, performance enhancements? Currently the only regulations surrounding that are for live finals because how do you police something if someone's playing from their own room? Right. You can't physically right. test them when you're miles away, but they will watch for it at live finals. It's interesting oh. about Adderall. Some uh, esports players say they do it openly. Like, they literally talk about it. They're like, yeah, it works. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's not something you want the college and university students to get right. into the habit of doing. Definitely, definitely not. not. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely not. So they're not tested, but they are on the lookout for anybody who may be um, using these types of drugs. Yes, and it's usually fairly often to spot the signs and symptoms of it. Or they tend to talk about it openly, like Steve said, like, at live events, and that'll like catch them every about time. It and like cold sweating. Right. Yeah, but yeah, I use Adderall. A lot of players don't tend to read the fine print when they register for tournaments. They don't scroll through to see oh, that that's there right. is a drug they policy. They just gotta accept everything, scroll on by, take a yep. pill, get in the tournament, and disqualify. So well, <laughs> they might not think that they can't talk about it, or they shouldn't be doing it. That's right. true. Right, and that's well. That's that's one thing about esports in general is the professionalism is not all the way there yet. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you don't know yeah. something's wrong until you're told, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the the thing that I can kind of compare this to, obviously, is the the one game that's super in my wheelhouse, which you guys know is <gasps> League of Legends. No, Smash starts with a P, ends with an Pokemon. Pokemon. There you go. So. <laughs> Um, within Pokemon for their for their uh, finals in their in their world tournament, yeah, um, they have a um, 
like a, a physical checker. They have like this little device that they plug into your your game system mm-hmm. to confirm that every one of the the Pokemon on your team are in fact legit. So, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even think about that. So one thing that a lot of people do is they they hack their Pokemon into yeah. the game and they might be completely legit in terms of stats and in terms of moves and like they're completely legal on a normal sense but if they were brought in through means that were not in game then the pokemon company will not sanction those pokemon to be used wow okay so you have to actually train your pokemon from the ground up that's, that's awesome right. that that makes it so much better actually oh, that sure. is awesome but i also <laughs> how in the world can you even track that there's a system that's so they cool. Could, yeah, that is really yeah, cool. They, like, they devised a system because there were too many people doing it. Well, yeah, it's easy, right? You're like, the oh, same... these are the cards I need, yeah. basically, right? And that's the same thing that, that we're talking about now to bring that back is that, you know, we're seeing that there are certain people who are getting ahead by doing certain things. And so those things are, are regulated. And even before seeing that those things happen, we regulate them ahead of time because we know that those kind of things like performance enhancing right. uh, uh, drugs or anything like that um, will affect a person's ability to, to play professionally and to play on a fair level with everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, a couple definitely. leaks have started to pick up on players using not physical enhancing, but mm-hmm. they'll use in-game hacks. So if you look at games like oh. CSGO or Rainbow Six, they now have clients that they have to be running in the background of their game to make sure that they aren't using any third-party oh, software while fantastic. playing. Oh my god. Are you Word kidding? Me? EXE. Well, for sure, and for, <laughs> for like um, Hearthstone, Deck Tracker was a big thing. And and a lot of, um, I don't know how, how that ended up, how, how the it works now but i know that a lot of people did not like having deck tracker in the in the background and they thought that it gave people an unfair advantage so they you know completely uh, uh, removed it from tournaments yeah um i don't know how that do you have any idea what that's like yeah, now? in yeah. professional play deck trackers aren't allowed on the, the finals or stages but occasionally depending on who's running the tournament they will give players a sheet of paper and a pen yes. to manually track Yes, it's like that in a lot of card games, actually. Um, it, it's funny how, how much of a parallel there is between physical card games and digital card games. How um, in physical card games, for tournament play and for um, you know seating and all that, uh, you do get a piece of paper and you do get a, a pen for most tournaments. Um, but then when you get to the finals, they either do or they don't. You kind of flip between them. So it's interesting to hear that. I didn't know that. So, Sarah, can you, moving on from that, sorry, (laughs) uh, can you talk to me a little bit about the hurdles um, of sort of collegiate esports? You know, what's what's stopping you from becoming, you know, uh, like NCAA level, um, you know, stuff like that? Collegiate is still very ground roots. So a lot of the ways, first, the professional foundation had to be built. And then similarly to with the start of CSL, once there is leagues being run, people will play, people will join them. But there's a big hurdle with getting your school to be officially varsity involved with these tournaments. A lot of the people who actually play in these leagues are just a group of buddies that put a team together and registered. Mm -hmm. The biggest hurdle is usually educating the staff and faculty at your college and university. Mm -hmm. Uh, Esports isn't naturally something that they see on the day-to-day, so because they don't know much about it, they don't understand it. you mean you don't know what Twitch is? (laughs) But they're paying more and more attention now that it's becoming mainstream media. Now that they hear 16, 15-year-olds are winning 3,000 playing four, 3 million. You're right. Playing 3 four million million. dollars. You forgot a few right. zeros yeah. there. <laughs> so I guess that's why they're trying to get people like you into these programs. Mm-hmm. They noticed that I was, first of all, a student that used to go to campus here. I used mm. to run my own leagues anyways. I ran my own events. I started varsity on a student level. And right. once they started to make an official faculty push to have it officially supported on college, they were like, well, you you already did a lot of these things and you know a lot more about it than we might. So why don't you come educate us and then run this for us? Mm, yeah, they had, a, they had an esports, uh, you know, prodigy in the making already here on home campus. So they just brought her back to kind of, you know, exactly. Exactly. Home the grown. land. 100% I think that was a really grown. smart move for sure to e- even... To bring it kind of away from you and talk about the role specifically is is 
if they were to, to create something like this, they would need somebody uh, kind of at the top of it who knows all of these things, who has been in all of these things, who's, who's experienced all of these things, because not a lot of people have right now. But even um, better, in, in she did it here. Have. Yeah, exactly. And to get somebody, and that was my next point, to get somebody that kind of did it all uh, at their establishment is, is huge. It's and a huge advantage, I would think. What yeah, a definitely. perfect puzzle piece. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's a trend that you're starting to notice more and more yeah. as schools are starting to do something with esports. They'll either pull in a student leader who used to run the esports club or the esports varsity, or they'll pull in a business professional, but then they have to catch that person up on all the campus regulations, right. teach them about esports. So those are the two approaches that I've seen. And it's very nice to see the student leaders move into these positions because they've already unofficially been doing it. Mm. That's right. So if anybody out there... You know, <laughs> being a leader right now, keep at, on it because, you know, yeah, you know there's some lead. opportunity at, for you. At yeah. your school, yeah. Listen up. But we're actually going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, uh, and when we come back, we're going to go into the uh, future of of uh, collegiate esports and, and talk about some other things, too. So we'll see you in a little bit. Stay there. Don't leave me. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, we are still here with our uh, conversation with Sarah Wag. Um, we actually wanted to go a little bit deeper into the future of collegiate esports. We went ten years into the into the past, and we talked about what it was like in two thousand nine. We went into the present. We're here in twenty nineteen, and we thought it would be interesting to kind of, given what is happening now in twenty nineteen, if we keep going down this path or if we make subtle changes, what will um collegiate esports look like in 2029 2029. the the way of the future the future yeah welcome let's let's start with our our expert guest sarah what uh (laughs) what do you think with with collegiate esports i think it's legitimizing the space currently Hmm. but we're still on the beginning entry level of that in the present with canada with the states of course they're a little bit farther so if i look further into the future of collegiate esports I think it will be a common household term, first of all. Mm -hmm. I think everyone will understand it. I think it won't be looked down upon for children to be doing this. I don't think their parents will be like, get off that video game. Don't go to school for games. Finally. We're starting to see now (laughs) that people are accepting it. And they're like, wow, you should go to school for this. So I think 10 years into the future, it's going to be fully accepted, fully supported. But at the same time, I'm not quite sure what it's going to look like financially. Mm. Currently, we're seeing that... In the media, people are always saying it's a one to two billion dollar industry. There's so much money in it, but all of that money, people might not know, is for advertising. A right. lot of it isn't necessarily players making money, salary, the cost of individuals working in that industry. A lot of it is just companies wanting esports consumers to know about their products. So a lot of non people. They just want people. that demographic. Exactly. Yeah. And the only way to make money is through like entertainment. But I think that they'll start to become comfortable with it in the future. I think they'll probably have already hit their esports demographic, realize that not all gamers are immediately interested in their product, and that interest will start to fall and they'll start to pay less and less into the industry, especially at the collegiate level. We're more of the amateur league than the pro league. Right. Do you think that with collegiate esports becoming a household name, do you think you would see less people playing uh games recreationally because the, the way that i would i, I kind of would think about it is um you take soccer for instance we go into typical sports and how mm. at a certain point in a young person's career or a young person's upbringing they don't play soccer for, for fun. fun yeah you right, don't they, play they for play fun it, anymore yeah you go to a on, club exactly you got your soccer moms now you have your esports moms everybody packed in a van with their keyboards heading to <laughs> right play so I'm, overwatch I'm, I'm curious if if the parallels there kind of match and and what you would think about that i think it's very similar because the individuals who might not play casually still have a tendency to watch mm. and keep up with the sport and you see the exact same thing in esports about 20 to 30 percent of the demographic don't play they right. just watch they like things like the overwatch league they like tuning in to see what the pros are up to there's also a percentage that only play casually they don't want to touch competitive because they know that's not something they're interested in pursuing right and competitive players love to play mostly competitive but they'll still play 
a couple casual Casually. games. They might go to play with fans. They might do it as a warm up. It might be a team exercise. Mm -hmm. So everybody kind of hits a different section. Yeah, the um, the anxiety toward becoming a a good player for a lot of people is is very real. And and you know, I know for me, I watched uh, things like Dota, things like Hearthstone, things like. Um, you know, CSGO, I watched people play those far longer than I actually played them because I just, I, I knew that I wasn't cut out to be able to put in that kind of effort to become one of those top players. And and so at some point I thought, well, if I'm not being a top player, then what's the point in playing this game? I'll just watch the good people play it and oh, you Mike, know, that'll be my entertainment. You can be a good player. <laughs> now you're, you're different. You're interesting because you play a ton of dota and you watch a ton of dota yeah. and and i know that you've you've famously said that you do want to become a a professional player in in the game steven but it has been famously said famously <laughs> um but i'm i'm interested that you know you actually do pursue that just on a, on a recreational level as well yeah 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 so, um i don't know i just uh I can't play. I can't play for fun. Mm. I don't know. It's you like have weird. to be working towards it's, something. It's fun for me to be the best. Yeah, like that's what is fun. Um, so I'm definitely one of those people who would have loved to like be born now and have my mom drive me to right. <laughs> to and like so collegiate definitely. esports would be a great place for, for people for you. like and me. That's, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. Even like if we go back a couple minutes, where you you full on said you know. Um, oh damn! Too bad I'm not enrolled in in full time classes. Else I would be a yeah. I would definitely. Yeah. I would I'm definitely jealous be of here. anybody who's living in the now, like yeah, in who's into esports. Is yeah. If you're a 16 year old kid now, there's so much open for you that I yeah. I wish I had when I was that age. So I would say it's even better if you're like 10 because uh, if you're 16, you're still getting a little bit of shit from your parents. Okay, but like if you're 10 now. Oh my God, the shit I had to hear and go through and live through to play games right. would That's be true. out the window. A lot People of the would be like, now, yeah. they, they live through that 10 already. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, if you're 10 and your mom hears like whatever and you're talking about Fortnite and, she, you know, there's like that little ding in her head and she's like, wait, didn't some, didn't I just hear on the news someone won $3 million for Fortnite? I'll get my kid on that, whatever, who cares? <laughs> and then, you know, now there's all this like mainstream media yeah. and whatever. And you have that kind of, you know, six years to be groomed into whatever you want to do. There you um, go. Yeah. You know, instead of just like picking up the ball and going to play with your friends, you're like, you're going to play to win. You know so I mean? in 2029, it's going to look very different. In 2029, my kid's playing in tournaments. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're all looking forward to. And so. Sarah's teaching him how to get there. There you go. Yeah, I like to think of collegiate as a feeder system because high school leagues, are they don't exist too much, especially in Canada. But if you're trying to parallel with sports, you start in elementary school, you play through high school, you get picked That's up for true. scholarships in college and university. We don't have that same system for eSports. Mm -hmm. And we're starting backwards. We're starting with colleges and universities. Do you see that coming? I have been contacted for a couple of high school leagues. High school professors are starting to realize that if they start at the high school level, they can get picked up for colleges and university scholarships. Fantastic. So they see the value for their students to get involved. That's an interesting point that you brought up that it is it has started backwards. I was thinking about that too, but I thought maybe I was dumb for thinking that way because of it not existing. I was like, mm. oh, you know, I must be stupid thinking that like, you know, why aren't high school clubs doing this? Yeah. Um, but it does make sense for you to start at high school anyway, you, you know, especially in video games. I feel like your reflexes are just better. Well, it, well, right now it, I guess, went from pro tier. So it went top down, right? There were pros yeah, and then yeah, there yeah. was nothing underneath. And then you get the one step below and the step below that. So Yeah, but we need to start younger because if you look at the average lifespan or uh, competitive career yeah. of an esports player, they are usually retiring by 25. There are oh, yeah. quite a few that stay until their their mid thirties. Hear that, boys? I'm, my time's we're coming peaking. up. We're peaking. Yeah, we're getting up there. <laughs> twenty nine, you're retiring. That's it. Twenty twenty nine. Twenty twenty nine. I'm retired for years, bro. That's fair. <laughs> I'm a caster. I'm just like some analyst now at this point. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that that's good. I think let's uh, let's move on. Yeah. Um, Sarah. 
Can you tell us a little bit more? And I know we kind of uh, spoke about this at the beginning, but I, I want to kind of go back into what your your role here at, at Durham College is. Um, so let, let's Durham go College from, represent. There you go. So let's go from the very beginning, what your role is, and then go as far down as you can. What my role is as in when I started first here, let's, working full time. Let's start right now in in the present, and then we'll go in the past from okay. there. In the present, my current role is to be working with students. In the eSports arena, this is a place for students to walk in, to play, to play on our varsity teams, to run their own events, to get mentorship from us, the staff, to teach them how to run their own events. It's scary starting out. If you wow. know someone's there to hold your hand, then yeah. you're willing to take those risks knowing that they'll help catch you when you fall. My so God, not, amazing is that? not only are you teaching them or sort of... Um, helping them become better competitively you're also teaching them other th like sort of uh, ancillary things surrounding things e like broadcast event management there's so many different uh -huh. career options that go into esports but a lot of people tunnel vision onto just players right. if it wasn't for all of us support individuals the industry wouldn't be floating the way it is definitely not that's no. such an interesting point yeah i totally agree and i mean that's that's kind of the thing with um things like this podcast even is like that there needs to be an ecosystem around the just the players. Yes, the spotlight might be on them, but it, the spotlight's only on them from the people who created the light. So, you know, if, if people around them are, are supporting them, then, you know, the, the entire industry thrives. It's like a, anything in entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody talks about the producer and the writer and... Hey, they get some awards. The A, the AD, <laughs> right. the PAs, and the the masses don't. The boom but, operator. Yeah, there's definitely space. Um, <laughs> the so, so, so yeah, continue. So with that, we are looking to, since we're in our first year, we're looking for a group of students to start a club at Durham College. We've noticed with colleges, they're usually diploma programs. You have your students for one to two years, maybe three, if they do some sort of additional program on top of that. But with universities, you get your students for four to five years. It's much of a longer lifespan. Mm -hmm, it's easier yeah. to cultivate and grow. The turnover is so quickly for college. So we're actively looking for students who are interested in the esports industry, not only to teach them, but to help them create a community so that we mm -hmm. can enter them into some of these collegiate um, opportunities like TESPA. Even if you're not competing in TESPA leagues, they'll still send you boxes of items for you to run events for, for viewing parties, for socials, uh, to get cool. your campus involved on a community level. That's amazing. So we're currently recruiting and looking for students who are involved in picking up some leadership roles and getting involved on that aspect. It's not like this. I'm, That's holding like a, <laughs> I'm holding up a pin I got from this event. I love it. It's yeah, but that's great. Like, if anybody's listening, you know, they're here to support you. You have. They do want to support. Yeah, so. there's resources. If like, I mean. You okay, said you're so looking for people. Let's go to, you said you were looking for students. Um, what did it look like when you were a student and sort of starting this up? Oh, yeah, the origin story. I want to hear this. The origin story. <laughs> if we go back about five years, because I took a five-year degree, in my first year, the Durham College campus was joint with Ontario Tech. It was a joint college university. Okay. So there was already an existing club on campus. Mm. I noticed them in the hallway. They would always have a, a booth set up talking about their event, trying to convince you to come out. But being a first year, I was a nervous wreck. Seeing a bunch of boys <laughs> at the table and being a female, I was a nervous wreck. I'm sure. Because back then, the, the female stigma was a lot heavier than it is now. Yeah, that's true. So I didn't want to approach them and be like, hey, can I come to your event? Like, I really like video games. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I passed on the first event, and I wish I hadn't. Because second semester, I rallied a group of friends, so I felt comfortable, nice. and we went out to cool. attend this event. And it was a big LAN event, and it's really something else to see a bunch of computers all lit up in a room everyone's cheering everyone's yelling oh, it was amazing mm -hmm. yeah so with that the grassroots land i fell in love with it i was like this is where i want to be i want to get involved with this i want to help make this happen so i started volunteering my second year within that first semester of me volunteering i went from a volunteer to being an executive within the same semester huh. just because <laughs> i i love paperwork i wanted to be a secretary growing up so i was like uh, sponsorships. Do you guys do those? Do you want some help with that? I was very shy. So I was like, give me all the paperwork so I don't have to talk to anybody and right. I'll get it all done for you guys. So we pulled in sense. Oh, wow. about $10,000 worth of scholarships oh or gosh. sorry, sponsorships. And we were able to prize five major tournament titles. Oh, shit. We took up an entire university building and we had about, I think, 750 that year. And then when I was handed off presidency my following year, I was transitioned into it. 
we did the same thing, but because we had the previous experience, we ended up running a LAN event with 1,300 attendees, making us the second largest in Canada. Wow. But it was entirely student-run. The mm-hmm. campus didn't really understand us. They are like, okay, you're the video game club. You get this much money a year. Talk to you next year. So they give you they gave you a budget. I'm assuming you didn't have to pay for the building to use it or anything like that. No. Um, wow. Okay, so they you got... A little bit of support, not too much. But at the same time, she sounds like it sounds like a hero origin story. <laughs> it's like you know, um, like Wiz Kid. You know, I, at first I was like you know just somebody helping around, and then I turned into the CEO. <laughs> She's like president in what a year and a half. That's crazy. But it's because I was willing to put the work in, and a lot yeah. of people were there to enjoy the event. They didn't necessarily want to help plan the event because there's two right. types of people. Yeah. Right. The people that want to, and we were all students at the time too, right? So you're trying to balance your work schedules, your school, school schedules, work. trying to help out with this video game club on the side. And then you got Secretary Sarah over here. Oh, my grades sucked. Don't do what I did. <laughs> I put way too much time and effort into this club oh, because I loved it so much. But, but hey, I was a biology major. It made no sense for me to get involved with this video game club at all. My parents were right. like, what are you doing? Your grades suck. Focus on science. But... I kind of get a good chuckle now that I'm working in esports out of college full time. I'm like, ha. <laughs> it paid I mean, off. It really, like you, you, you never know where you're going to end up if you just immerse yourself in, in something. And that's kind of what post-secondary is meant for anyway. Is not necess- Well, the major is there because it's, it's what you're you know, supposed to be going in for. And most people, they do focus exactly on their major. But the whole point is to, you know, offer other things. And, and for those people who go out and actually try those other things, you know, you, you end up in the craziest of places. Yeah. Like for me in, in my first year, I ended up in a, a play of Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog. And that was such a like critical moment for me and my like musicality because I didn't really uh, explore too much. Oh, absolutely, I can sing, dude. Can you sing can something you? right now? <laughs> no, not into this mic. Not into this mic. Um, but no, it was it was interesting because I got to I had never done anything dramatic before, but I thought, hey, you know what? I'm going to try this play. It's based on this uh, video series that I loved. Um, you know, it, just the the year before it had come out. Um, but, but to get back to this, like just to get into anything new and to try new things, it takes you into wild paths. Definitely. Yeah. I don't know if any of us really saw us ending up in esports. Oh, for sure. Like how you don't, you can't see that coming. No, not at all. I thought I was going to work in a lab and put in my time, clock in my time card. I think that's interesting. I, I'm in a different boat. I saw the potential maybe. Um, but I think the, I think the road that I took was unexpected. Mm -hmm. Like I always wanted to do something in video games. I wanted to be like a video game developer. I wanted to make stuff. Mm. Um, but I was always competing like nonstop. Even as a kid, Mm. uh, I had to be the best at my school. I had to be the best in my friend group. I had to be the best in every kind of social environment, like. You know what I mean? You go to like a friend's house and they're like, oh, you have Smash? Like, let's go. Let's see who's mm. better. And I had to beat them. Like, I was always It's a that. must. It's a must. It is a must. Sure. And then I thought in my head, um, you know, there are like these tournaments going on. People are doing this. This is a thing. This is happening. Like, I want to be in this. Um, but I didn't do that young. You know, the reason that I got into esports is because of Dota. Okay. And the only reason that I got into Dota was because I had a job at McDonald's and one of my coworkers played this game uh-huh. and he explained it to me and it sounded so stupid in my head. He's like, yeah, <laughs> there are these creeps in the jungle that sleep and you have to like go kill them for gold and then you go and like you kill the other people and then you kill break this base. building uh-huh. and then when the building breaks, you win the game. And I was like, what in the hell are you talking about? I play Counter-Strike and... And now you're the esports homie. And now I'm the esports homie. Yeah. Famously, <laughs> Famously. known. <laughs> um, Change that Instagram handle. Esports <laughs> homie. Yeah. But but that's interesting. Like, uh, you, you don't see it too often in, in kind of that direction where you want to be one thing and then you fall into into players. Uh, but, like, the, the people who want to be pro players a lot of the time I feel like they don't they don't see the things around them um, yeah as usually well. like, it's the other way yeah exactly like people would then go into game development and be like no actually I don't want to be a pro player I want to be the one who makes the games um, or I want to be the broadcaster or I want to be this that or the other 
Yeah. Um, so it's interesting that for you, it kind of went the other way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd still love to make a game. I just, uh, I think I'd want to be like the director of it. I, mm -hmm. I want to like have a vision and then, you know, get a group of people and collaborate on this vision. Yeah. Instead of like doing it all on my own, I would never want to do like a Fez thing because I would, I would be like 10 years of in development and it would have to be like perfect because right. I did everything to right, it right, right. and I'd probably like go into Well, developing a game by yourself is just crazy. Yeah. So that was Fez. I don't know if you ever heard of yeah, that, but there's yeah. like a really good documentary about that. And uh, he, he's, I see similarities in that and I would have went into like an insanity spiral. <laughs> yeah. So Sarah had help. Uh, she was not doing it by herself when uh, she was getting this club started. Um, do you have any quick tips for everybody or for anybody out there who would maybe want to start a club at their school? Yes. The first thing is to not be afraid to get involved. Ooh. Because if there's no one to take that first step, nothing's yeah. going to happen. Just All do you've got to do is approach your... Every school's got a club association. The easiest thing you could ever do is just start a club. You might need 10 people with signatures. If you're not too nervous, then I'm sure you could get those 10 signatures. There's so many people that are many, interested. Yeah. So you could find a group, get that club started. Once you've got that club started, well, you'll probably be allocated a certain amount of funding per semester. You don't need to go too hot and wild off the tracks, like slow <laughs> yourself down, start it slow, but run a couple events. They don't need to be big. They don't need to be tournaments. Run socials. Socials are mm -hmm. how you bring out people that are interested in the community. Get involved with other companies and organizations around you. They'll have pull that you as a new organization might not have. But people will come to you because they'll have the same hobbies that you have. Right. You just need to name a time and place for them to show up. I think socials are good too because then you can see uh, in your school how many people there are that are interested in the same thing that you are. Totally. And I think you'd be pleasantly surprised to see just how many there are. <laughs> Oh, we're out there. Yeah. We're, there's a lot of gamers we're there, everywhere. And gamers are always in the shadows. So, like, you know, you have to kind of pull them out, pull yeah. them out a little bit. Or look for them when you go to your local gaming events. With when I started the varsity program, I actually went to an event in Toronto. Yeah. And I entered the solo queue League of Legends tournament. Hey. Uh, Someone that was put on my team was like, hey, I'm a first year going to Durham College. Like, is there any esports at the college? And I was like, heck yeah, there's sports at the college. Like, come out <laughs> to our events, come get involved. He was also, um, he had played competitively quite well. And I was like, well, you know what? I want to start a varsity program on campus. You have that competitive player standpoint. Why don't you come to the pitches with me and talk to the school about what it's like being a professional player and playing on a collegiate level? Right. That's amazing. So you just find these people everywhere. Everyone's got some sort of gaming hobby or knowledge. You've just got to find them. Everybody's a player. You're playing something. Either it's Candy Crush on your phone or, you know, Overwatch at home, or you're a professional Counter-Strike player. We're all out there. Yeah. So. Okay. And you yeah. know what? Um, do you think you can tell us a little bit about the the event that we're at right now where we've stolen you away, essentially, from, <laughs> <laughs> from a massive group? Um, and, and I'd like to kind of hear a little bit about that. Yeah, well, we snuck away. But currently at the Durham College Esports Arena, we're doing a 24 hour charity LAN in support of Extra Life. Mm who do the Sick Kids Foundation Hospitals, and Amazing. our local one is Sick Kids Toronto. We want to show that gaming is a force for good. Still so frequently we hear negative stigma attached to gaming. Of course, oh, yeah. God, yeah. We want to show what we can do with gaming. Mm -hmm. We have a, a Durham ambassador, a sick kid patient, little boy, breaks your heart. He wanted to be a soccer player growing up. He was diagnosed and unfortunately had to go through quite a few treatments and now he plays FIFA, which is a soccer video game and that's how he copes and it just breaks your heart to mm. see that gaming can be such a force for good. It can help you overcome the toughest times and he, he came to talk a little bit about that today and to share his story with other people because when people say that video games are bad for you, he's like, what? Yeah. Oh, how could video cool. games Absolutely be bad not. for you? Like it helped me through my toughest time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like that for so many people, whether it's helping meet new friends, whether it's giving you a safe space, there's something in gaming for everyone. And it really is a cause for good. And we want to show that. That's awesome. Okay. So I think with, with that said, um, we're going to wrap things up here. I think that's a, a good positive note to leave on. Definitely. Um, so Sarah, <laughs> I want to, that was a crazy positive note. Yeah, that was, that was wild. Um, Sarah, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be on our podcast. Thank Sarah, you. Thank you so is much. There, is there any place that, that people can find you right now? 
Oh, of course. They can find me on all of the Durham College Esports socials, mm-hmm. DC Esports. My own handle is smileybox, LOL. So if you want to come find me personally, I'm just a little smiley click away. <laughs> but I'm always happy to talk about collegiate esports, the esports industry. If you have questions or need a little helpful push, I really think the esports industry can build itself up if we continue to help each other. Mm-hmm. Nice. Fantastic. Steven, you want to talk about where people can find you? Yeah, you can find me at uh, Stephen Petrusic on Instagram. That's S T E V A N P E T R U S I C. Soon to be the esports homie. There you go. <laughs> and I'll be waiting for you there. There you go, Alex. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Uncredible Hulk. That's U N. Yeah. <laughs> that's, all, that's all the places that he wants to be found right now. That's the only place you need to be found. Exactly. And then, of course, for me, you can uh, find me on all the socials at Still Just Mike. That's Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, YouTube, all of those. Um, Please also make sure to follow the uh, the podcast at BO3 Podcast on Instagram, BO3 Podcast on Twitter, uh, or send an email to BO3 at organizedgaming.co. And with that, we are going to head on out. So everybody, I hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful life, and we will see you next week. Yeah, thank you so much. Can't wait to see you guys again. All right, see you guys then.